Okay, I think everyone moved rooms, so we are complete again. Kate and Tom will entertain us. It's a little exercise. You have to basically unpack the title. Im improving second language reading through visual attention cues to corpus-based patterns. Imagine what the talk will be about, and in 20 minutes you compare your thoughts to what you have learned. Thank you very much. So I'm Kate Chalice. My maiden name is Vasicek. Uh, so I have some Czech ancestry, and I love Czech. Um, I am getting my PhD right now in applied linguistics at Iowa State University. Yeah, and I'm Tom. I'm a UI developer currently, but I do have MS in natural language processing, and yeah, I'm doing this as a hobby, basically. Okay, so theoretical background for our tool that we built. What you need to know is that in order to read in a second language, you need to have about 95 to 98% vocabulary coverage in the text. That's quite a lot, especially if you're just learning the language. There's also been a lot of research prior to what we've done that says that when you're reading, if you attend to your top-down strategies, you're more successful. And that's not just true in your L1, it's also true in your L2. So corpus-based data can help us understand and focus on the important words. What are important words? Probably important words are core words, words that are frequently used and widely dispersed across a language. Also, we know that visual attention cues can be helpful and they can help offload some of that burden on your working memory. Some of us, uh, well, all of us have different uh, memory memory uh, issues. <laughs> I know I do, and uh, anything that I can do to resolve that is a, is a good thing. Okay, so this is a text in Czech that I wanted to read. And I'm fairly certain some of you don't speak Czech, some of you do. But if you don't speak Czech, when you're confronted with a text like this, what do you see? It's a wall of words, and they didn't pay their vowel tax, apparently, because there's not enough vowels. Um, there are many Vs and Ks, and it's really difficult for you to know which word to prioritize for your learning. I'll give you a little bit of background about this text. This is from a 2019 uh, bachelor's thesis, I'm not sure if it's bachelor's thesis or what, but she wrote about the everyday life experience for people living on the Huckvaldi estate. This is where my ancestors lived, and it, it was their everyday life experience during the, thir the Thirty Years' War, so 1618 to 1648. This is really, really deeply interesting to me, and I, I really wanted to read it. So, Let's try to make it a little bit more legible. Here we have highlighted all of the red words. These are keywords, so these are like not very frequently occurring words. The yellow words are function words, and then we have lexical words in blue, and those are the ones that I haven't learned yet. That there are other ones that are on the page, but the ones that are in blue are the ones that I haven't learned yet. So. If we look at this, oh, by the way, I, I realize some of you don't speak Czech, so I gave you a translation. <laughs> um, if you want to get 95% text coverage, if you're looking at just these highlighted words, it's only 56%. That is not enough. But, you know, there's actually some named entities like, you know, Mansfeld. That is something that I could figure out what that means. And that gives us up to 68%. And then, you know, like these function words, they're pretty guessable, but depending on the context, that brings us up to 79%. Also, cognates are guessable, like we have civilnich, so of civilians. I can guess what that means. That's 81% text coverage. And then I actually might already have some knowledge of some of these words, like, you know, what was it? It was miestiane, like this is a nice good genealogy word, and I know this word, a burger, right? So uh, that gives us up to 85%. That's still not 95%. However, I hope you've noticed that this process of highlighting can help prioritize and focus which word is the most important to learn. See, now, getting rid of all those other ones, we can see that there's 
much less of a wall of text before us and we can kind of zoom in and focus on the words that are most important to learn. So the main goal of what we built was to provide a tool that can help users to input whatever text they want. So it's a browser extension. That way it can be, you know, Chesquiro's class. It could be what, whatever text you want. It's an authentic text and it can help us visualize these linguistic patterns and it can be very customizable. And we wanted to build something that can minimize distractions so that you're not taken away from your page. Something that you can just click on the text and it will show you some information about a word that you don't know so that you can keep moving forward with your reading and not get distracted. And also, you know, sometimes you want to export those word lists and practice them on your own. So I enlisted my friend, uh, this native Czech speaker, <laughs> to help me to implement this task. And we'll talk about it now. The steps are basically, uh, you know, all the way up to number five. And uh, actually, the step number one, there's actually a step zero, <laughs> which is to build this uh, core vocabulary list of Czech, the Czech general service list. Um, I basically, this was my master's thesis project, and um, many of the researchers here who provided these wonderful Czech corpora are, are actually here today, which is just so cool to me. Um, but basically, we built a word list. It's 10,000 words long, um, and it is the, the core, it represents the core vocabulary across written and spoken and um, both uh, versions of, of Czech. Yeah. So the data that we used to build a tool, as Kate said, uh, CGSL, which is the core list, actually contains ranks of the words, which means how important or common the words are, with like to be being number one, down to the 10,000. It contains the lemmas, the part of speech tags for the words, and the modality, which is whether the word is universal or more likely to appear in a written or spoken context. We also wanted to have the word forms more logical analysis. So we used the good old MICA tool for that, which is a well-established tool for Czech. We wanted to have a phonetic component to it, which is why we used the U-phonometer, which gave out the IPA, how the words are pronounced. And uh, we are planning to also include definitions, translations, etymology information, and so on, for which we are planning to use the dictionary data for starters. Yeah, just so you see, this is Mica. Mica is like a command line tool. So you give it a word like Ucheni here, and you get a bunch of tags, the Brno format tags, for like the cases and, and other grammatical information. This is what the Uphonometer looks like. It gives you the IPA transcription of whatever you put there for check, which is very useful. And yeah, you know how Wiktionary looks like. Yeah, so we decided to build a browser extension. We are working with Google Chrome. Google Chrome is the most widely used browser today. And it also kind of sets the standard, even like technical standards. So an extension for Google Chrome is pretty easy to port into other browsers as well. So this uses JavaScript, HTML, CSS technology, the same that's used on the web. And we are adding, adding UI elements into your browser and to end the page. So you get an extension icon that activates the functions. You get a dedicated settings page where you can configure how you want the extension to behave. And you get the UI elements, the overlay that are added to the page when you activate the extension, which is a pop-up bubble, a side panel, which is especially useful if, if you want to build a list of words, for example, those that you don't know. And you can get a detailed view for word detail or statistics of the given page. So this is how it looks like. This is the settings page. The core thing, actually the original working name for the project was highlighter, although we call it Lexi now, is that you define highlighting rules. And here you can define basically what should be highlighted and how it should be highlighted. So here you have a complicated word a complicated rule that says that the words that are in the most common words list, CGSL, that are part of speech tag, noun, adjective, verb, you can select the modality marker, and you can also set the threshold. For example, if you are only interested in the less common words, and you can combine it together. 
And then you can set a color scale or single color for it. You can use transparency or whatever color you want. And and yeah, you can also configure external lookup services, which you can then access very easily. I, I especially like Triruchka. This is a, a really useful tool to disentangle the mess of check cases. Yeah. So, and how it actually works is that you get an icon of an extension up there, or you can activate it using a shortcut. And when you do, the page is highlighted, the word, on the text on the page. So, this is how it looks like with, in the very simple case where, like, everything that's in the CGSL on the list of most common words is highlighted, and the darker the shade of blue is, the more common the word is. And you can see that I did a pretty good job making this list, huh? Like it's got pretty good coverage, right? Yeah. Almost everything is highlighted. This is not that useful, of course. <laughs> this is just a demonstration. Then when you, when, when you hover your mouse over a word, you do get a pop-up bubble, which actually tells you the rank, uh, the, the lemma of the, of the form, uh, the register, the part of speech tag, and you can, you can look it up in your configured external sources. You can also set this up to have the whole side panel, which in addition to the information that were in the bubble, you can mostly, this allows you to work with word lists. You can, you can just create any number of word lists and add words to them. An important thing uh, that you can do is to configure the way to add the words with some combination of keys and mouse clicking. So you can do this seamlessly. You just see a word that you want to file for later use you can just like for example control click it and it gets filed into your pre-configured list you can then return to it later you can export the whole list uh, together with the information and, and this have. is really useful because then it doesn't take you out of the experience of reading so you're not getting like into the endless bubble of dictionary lookups while reading yeah you can see that you actually get like the timestamp the source page the context where the word occurred where you clicked it so that can be useful. And yeah, then you can actually get into the detail of the word if you're really interested. You can, you can see the occurrences of the word in the current page. You can see the forms of the lemma and the, their statistics, which can be very useful because uh, as a learner, you usually don't have any idea like what the distribution of the forms are. Some are usually very common and other less so. And what you also get is the phonetic distance. This is something that we discovered like in practice because there are a lot of false friends or sometimes like Kate thought that she knows what a word means, but she meant a different word, which was, it sounded really similar, but wasn't quite it. So what this gives you is the Levenstein distance in IPA, in the sound of the word. So these are the closest sounding words. Yeah, and this is the statistics page, which actually shows you detailed statistics of all the words on the highlighted page. And the last thing, important thing, is a satisfied user, of course. Yay. <laughs> okay, and so yeah, the step four is to use it. And as we use it, then we can improve it and build upon it. And um, I, I want to point out that, you know, when we showed you how the CGSL, like, as, as just without any filters, wasn't very useful, was it? Because if everything's highlighted, nothing's highlighted. Um, but here, we, we discovered, like, as, as we were using it, we discovered that we really had to create these filters, especially for words that I already had in my own mental lexicon. So it's very personalizable. Like, I can... I can do, um, I can build my own, sometimes I have a word that's a rank that's really, 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 really high on the CGSL and sometimes it's really low. So it, it's variable depending on how I learn. Um, but then we also discovered that um, it is actually really useful to highlight words that are not in the CGSL. These are what we are calling keywords. They are effectively the really uncommon words that they're, they really show the aboutness of the text that you're working with. And we found they're usually named entities, but sometimes they're not. And sometimes you end up with a situation like this, where you have everything highlighted. This is a glossary from a, a like a, in the back of a book that we were reading that these are all archaisms and none of them are in the dictionary. 
Well, they're in the dictionary, they're not in the CGSL. Um, we also really decided to move forward with this phonetic data because I kept making mistakes like, oh, Pages, oh, that must mean Paris. No, it means a tree stump, okay. Or Chromi, Chrome, okay. Uh, now I know that the Chrome browser is the lame browser. Uh, you know, I, like it was very, very often that in my head, I think I was storing these words in the same area and so they were activating based off of sound. So this is a really important and kind of innovative feature that we're introducing. Also, we really need to increase the consistency in the underlying data. So the part of speech tagging and limitization in the CGSL is flawed, and that has to do with flaws in the original source corpora. Um, we are, we're actually able to uncover some of those flaws, and it would be my dream to help to rectify some of them. One of the funniest ones was the, the lemmatization for the word hospoda was uh, a little bit lacking. That was pretty funny, because you'd think that as a as a check word, that would be fairly important, but anyway. Yeah, uh, as we already said, we are planning to add more data, starting with the dictionary, which is an easy source to reach, to reach out to. The more work to be done is to better isolate the UI component that we are adding from the actual web page, because uh, tweaking web page in the browser is a tricky business, not to break the page actually, so you can use it as you go. Uh, we would, I'd like to refine the tokenization criteria, the way that this works with numbers and stuff, because those behave in a very specific way. And of course, like as any programmer, the internal data structures could be optimized. An, internal, an interesting idea that we have is that we might actually add a real-time morphology analyzer to the tool, so we could actually see lemmas and stuff even off words that are not on the list, because right now we have the pre-process data for, for the CGSL, but not for the unknown words. And obviously, the principles are language agnostic, so this can be made to work in any other language. We just started with Czech because it's extra interesting to us. Yeah, and that's actually my dream, is to make this uh, available, especially for the, the languages that don't have a lot of lear learner resources, especially back home in the States, where it would be really useful for, for learners of Estonian, learners of Slovenian, learners of Ukrainian, to have access to a tool that can help them to read better. And that is our presentation. This is a picture of Huck Valdi. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> I think they, do, they did a good job. They unpacked the title for me. It's very obvious what they were trying to do. And I see a first hand also from America. Thanks, Jill. Hi there. Nice to hear a familiar accent. Um, I am wondering about the use of, you're, you're using uh, Wiktionary for the, the um, definitions, right, that you're pulling into the tool. So if I saw how that worked correctly, you're um, trying to avoid having someone go out onto, elsewhere, they'll go back, the, the, yeah, there, and then the previous one. Um, avoid having to leave the reading in order to go look things up, which is obviously a, a, a desire that, that everybody who licenses data from us at Cambridge wants for their reader. You know, you click on a word and then you can look up the meaning of the word in context. And well, until chat GPT, which is part of what I'm going to talk about tomorrow, you know, so there's a spoiler alert. Um, you, that's the holy grail, right? It, of, um, uh, for polysemous words, it's not just finding the word, it's also which meaning in that context, right, is the one. And so um, I'm, I couldn't see, maybe it's partly my eyesight and, and also there's a lot of detail on the slides. Are you doing anything to sort of, to help identify in terms of the, the, the degree of granularity of your use of that, that, that word source, your 10,000 core, when we use core language and identify things like with the CEFR, we're going down to the um, sense level, not just the headword level, to identify what is actually going to help um, for that level of page. Is that even something that you have on the horizon for improvement? Do you think that's relevant enough to worry about? I'm curious about that. Thank you. 
Thank you. Yeah, that would be great, wouldn't it? That is the holy grail, the word sense, um, to try to try to get the what exactly which word it is. The fortunate thing about Czech is they're less polysemous than you might think. So that's that's one good thing. But yeah, on the horizon, if we could solve that problem, that would be that would be fantastic. Yeah, but also very difficult. So we're like starting small. At least, you know, this is better than nothing, so, yeah. It's not a question, but in, uh, in I don't know, the hybrid part of the conference, someone left a comment uh, basically saying, not using these words, that the diacritics are important. Was that an issue? When, when compiling the original CTSL, I used R, and it was a big issue in R. Um, R doesn't like diacritics very much when you're in Windows, because it, was, it told me things like, oh, you can only have these ones, you can't have those ones, you're in this. Uh, that was a nightmare. But for compiling this, I don't think there were any issues with diacritics. No, no, this, this was conceived with check in mind from the beginning, and obviously you need diacritics, like check doesn't work without it. Okay, I see two hands, three hands. First, I'll go from back to front. Hey, thank you for a very interesting talk and what looks like an excellent tool. If I were learning Czech, I'm sure I'd use it. Um, so one of the criticisms of word lists and of this counting the 90% of running words is that, yeah, it's all well and good knowing um, 90% of the running words, but if you're missing knowledge of a keyword, then you're stuffed basically, right? Uh, so you seem to have solved that with keyness, but again, what, a, what about, I think the issue comes down to polysemy there, right? It's because different words in, how do you deal with these uh, area specific or subject specific or semi-technical vocabulary? Have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that question, especially because what I'm interested in is very technical, actually. I love reading about historical documents and history and all these terms that are defunct now. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure yet. That would be a really interesting thing to, to look into. I, I do think it's helpful to have the keywords be highlighted. Um, they can they can really help draw attention. And I, I think there should probably be a way to deal with named entities because they're a different class of keywords, I think. Um, but yeah, that is a good point. Thank you. Hi, lots of interesting, good little ideas there that I hope to remember in the future. Uh, you mentioned in the beginning uh, something about a top-down strategy when reading a text which you find difficult. Uh, what is this top-down strategy? I'm not sure if I understand. Thank you, yeah. So um, I've cited some papers in the end um, that talk about it explicitly, but basically in second language acquisition, there's like the bottom up learning and the top down learning. And I, if I remember right, please remind me what it is, because I'm... <laughs> oh, good, yes, please, yes. We got help from Brazil. Thank you, Reggiani. Yeah, it's because uh, I am a professor of English, and uh, I was going to say that I teach with exactly what you are doing, and I would be very glad if my students had an app, because uh, I do that manually with them. I put the text, and I go, okay, so those are the function words, so those are, you know, so congratulations. I definitely think it works. Top down and bottom up. Uh, when we talk about uh, top down, it's when you see the text and you go from the general to the parts. And bottom up is when you would go by learning the vocabulary before going to the text itself. So that's the idea of top down and bottom up. Uh, this was into SP. 
ESP, English as uh, Specific Purposes, right? And there are many books uh, about it. I'm from old school, so I know all of them. <laughs> uh, just to throw a question back at you that you asked me during my demo. Uh, um, you mentioned uh, using Wiktionary at least uh, currently slash in the future. And like, I I'm curious, so the current dictionary data, um, I think you might have mentioned this, like where you're getting it from and also kind of what strategies you're using to try and get data out of Wiktionary as well. Well, Wiktionary was added like last week. So uh, <laughs> um, honestly, the, the, the primary goal was just to highlight because just highlighting was already a much better thing than seeing a text like this for me. Um, but yeah, there are other dictionaries that are better. For example, Slovnik says, says Nam Slovnik would be good. And th there, are, there are other sources out there. Um, I think we'll have to think more carefully about, um, you know, maybe collaborating with some lexicographers who know more than we do about dictionary data and how to import it and optimize that. So thank you. Yeah, one, one thing you can definitely do right now is to map your own, whatever sources you have that you can access via some URL query and get that in one click from the word that, that you can do for any source that you can access. And that's very useful. And we are looking into how to get the data right there so you wouldn't have to leave it, but that's more complex because we have to grab the data.